Good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Brown, Library Commissioner for the Chicago Public Library, and we are delighted to welcome you to this year's season finale of our One Book, One Chicago. Of course, you are the city behind our citywide read. For the past 22 years, One Book, One Chicago has brought our city together around incredible programming, and of course, writing. We've connected with preeminent voices, such as Toni Morrison, Art Spiegelman, and Harper Lee. And 2023 has kept this tradition alive. There There by Pulitzer Prize finalist Tommy Orange is an incredible exploration of 12 distinct yet interconnected Native American experiences. Each narrative describes the urban Native American experience in vivid detail, challenging us to look beyond stereotypes in favor of depth and individual stories. Through these voices, Orrin shows us the complex and changing identities of our modern world. And it's awe-inspiring to realize that this, this was Tommy's first novel. This year, through One Book, One Chicago, we've accomplished many goals. We've uplif uplifted diverse perspectives. We've discussed stories that proved thought-provoking. We've embraced the depth and richness of Native American experiences, a perspective that is vital but often overlooked. Our collective reading of There There provided such a tremendous opportunity for educators, librarians, community leaders, and Chicagoans as a whole to recognize and celebrate how vital the Native American perspective is to Chicago's history and future. And today we celebrate our opportunity to cherish these stories and amplify them. One Book, One Chicago is made possible by our talented library team, including coordinator of special projects, Jennifer Lezak, director of adult services, Kate Lipinski, our director of marketing, Shamil Clay, and our first deputy, Mary Ellen Mesner. Please join me in, sh in showing them some praise. <laughs> And One Book, One Chicago is generously supported by Chicago Public Library Foundation and our lead sponsors, Bank of America and United Airlines. And with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce Priya Sadarangani, Managing Director of Bank of America, to say a few words. Priya. Thank you, Commissioner Brown, and good evening, everyone. I'm Priya Sitarangani, and I'm the Chicago Market Executive at Bank of America and a Library Foundation board member. I have a hunch that this room is full of readers, so I think you'll all know what I mean when I say there is something magical about traveling through a big, bustling city like Chicago, looking up and seeing a book you love in the hands of a stranger. For me, this is translated to seeing someone in the line at the grocery store reading Midnight's Children, noticing someone on a park bench hunched over a copy of The Great Believers, or spying someone waiting for the bus, enraptured by white teeth. Each time I see these books out in the world, it's as though I've been briefly reunited with an old friend. And though I might not so much as make eye contact with the reader, in that moment, I usually feel a tiny spark, an electric connection to a complete stranger. This spark, I believe, is our joint connection to an author, our mutual experience of knowing a group of characters, and our separate, though linked, journeys through a great story. Most recently, I've been spotting copies of this year's One Book, Chicago, oh, One, Book One Chicago selection, There, There, Throughout the City. I've spotted the cover in the hands of strangers on billboards in my local branch and tucked into a few backpacks here and there. And each time I see someone in the throes of this wise, tangled, clever, heartbreaking jewel of a novel, I feel that same current pulse through my body. That jolt represents what imagine some of you in this audience might also feel when you see that cover. Lingering questions about long-held traditions, grief, 
Gratitude for Tommy Orange's masterful prose and the chorus of unforgettable voices we all had the chance to meet in this book. I'd argue that during this challenging time in our city and our country and our world, now more than ever, we are hungry for connection. During these times of stress, great books can forge connections and remind us of our shared humanity and offer a welcome indulgence and an escape. One Book, One Chicago offers all Chicagoans across generations and zip codes the opportunity to connect. When all is said and done, there will be over 150 One Book events across the library's 81 branches. Book clubs, film screenings, lectures, storytelling, and more. Bank of America is proud to sponsor this program, which cultivates stronger communities. One final note. We are lucky to live in a city where all of the libraries have been declared book sanctuaries by formal decree. But as you all know, this is a very challenging time for books and libraries nonetheless. There are many ways to support your local library. Donations, of course, are wonderful, but showing up, connecting with others, participating in the dialogue, that is all a very powerful way to support our libraries. So everyone in this room deserves a huge round of applause for being here today. Thank you. Please continue supporting our libraries however you can, and I hope all of you continue to engage with books like They're There, which elicit that unmistakable spark. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Public Library. I'm Jennifer Lezak and I manage the One Book, One Chicago program. On behalf of the staff of CPL, welcome. A few things to note before we get started tonight. Before we begin, we ask that you please silence those cell phones. Tonight's event is also being live streamed on CPL's YouTube and Facebook channels and will be available for on-demand viewing immediately following the program, so please tell a friend who couldn't make it tonight. I want to thank my colleagues at Chicago Public Library for their support in making the season of One Book, One Chicago possible, especially my colleagues in the Adult Services Department, all of the adult librarians in our neighborhood branches, and our tech staff here in the Cindy Pritzker Auditorium. Thanks also to our programming partner, the American Indian Association of Illinois, and Doreen Weesey and her team for helping to make our season so educational and enjoyable. And of course, thanks to all of you for being here. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce Tommy Orange, author of the 2023 One Book, One Chicago selection, There, There. As you know, There There was one of the New York Times Book Review's 10 Best Books of the Year and won the Center for Fiction's first novel prize and the Penn Hemingway Award. There There was also longlisted for the National Book Award, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Orange graduated from the MFA program at the Institute of American Indian Arts and was a 2014 McDowell Fellow and a 2016 Writing by Writers Fellow. He is an enrolled member of the Cheyenne and Arafo tribes of Oklahoma and he was born and raised in Oakland, California. Tommy will be in conversation this evening with Donna Seaman. Donna is the editor for Adult Books at Booklist, a member of the content leadership team for the American Writers Museum, and a recipient of the Lewis Shore Award for Excellence in Book Reviewing, the James Friend Memorial Award for Literary Criticism, and the Studs Terkel Humanity Service Award. She has written for the Chicago Tribune, the Los Angeles Times, and many other publications. She's been a writer in residence for Columbia College Chicago, has taught at Northwestern University and the University of Chicago. She created the anthology In Our Nature. Her author interviews are collected in Writers on the Air, and she is the author of Identity Unknown. Please join me in welcoming Tommy and Donna to the CPL stage. Thank you, thank you so much. It's wonderful to see a full house. Welcome to One Book, One Chicago finale with Tommy Orange. Thrilled to meet Tommy in person. Thank you to the Chicago Public Library, everybody who works here, the foundation, and, and all of you. So welcome, Tommy. Hi, thank you. Thank you all for coming out and for, uh, yes, everyone involved that has brought so much love and attention to the book. Um, I normally don't like introductions and people saying nice things about me. Um, <laughs> but I thought just now for the first time, people didn't know one of the, there's been a couple things that have been, that have happened to the book that have been really incredible. And um, I thought being in Chicago, 
You all should know that Obama put me on his best of list in 2018. <laughs> that is fantastic. Thank you. Well, so I like to start at the beginning of things. And I'm always curious about what brings someone to reading. Um, you know, what started you off on this path to become a writer? Can you talk about that a little? Yeah, so the library for me um, growing up was Oakland Pu Public Library was um, during the summer they had a program um, if you read a certain amount of books you got free A's tickets and that was um, go see a baseball game that was the extent of my interest in reading um, as a kid and in school um, I didn't do well um, and uh, it really wasn't until I got an undergrad in, in sound engineering. I was a musician, um, sort of got kicked out of high school and went to community college, became a musician, um, got this bogus degree, um, it being in studios and, um, and learned analog recording right at the death of analog recording, um, <laughs> like literally right before the MP3 came to life and um, made... Um, the quality versus quantity conversation end forever. Besides for hipsters who love vinyl now. Um, so it, it wasn't until I got out of college and realized there was no job that I wanted to do. Um, I ended up at a, uh, working at a used bookstore. And um, I don't know why I applied. I don't know why they hired me. I wasn't a reader. Um, or I didn't know immediately why. It became uh, apparent very soon after working there that she wanted to move two giant warehouses into one. So that meant moving books. Um, so before I was a musician, I was, um, I was an athlete. I played roller hockey, um, traveled around the country. And uh, this is, I was born in the 80s. Um, in the 90s, rollerblading became really huge. Um, it's sort of obscure and embarrassing now. If you see it, um, but I it was it was my everything for a while, and and there was a professional sports team in Oakland, and it seemed like a viable path. Um, anyway, so I I I was told to move the entire fiction section from the back of the store to the side, more like front of the store, and we didn't get very many customers, so. I got to read books and move books, and um, for the first time understood what fiction was and became a reader for the first time at a pretty late stage. And um, pretty soon after uh, realizing I loved fiction, I, I realized I wanted to, to try to write it. Oh, that's, that's a great story. So now I'm thinking about music. Do you think being a musician, um, inspired your particular writing style and the way you structured this book? I think um, I would still hesitate to call myself a musician. I think I'd probably call myself a failed musician. Um, I, I love to play and I, and I have been playing for a long time. Um, I think I, I realized that reading out loud and listening to the sound of sentences is a vital part of my revision process. And I think there is something sonically happening and something that I learned in my undergrad in listening to sound and learning about sound on this like um, microscopic level um, and sort of learning the inside of what sound is definitely influenced in an unconscious way um, the way I ended up revising um, fiction. Yeah, that reads musically, for sure, all the different voices. Um, before we talk about There, There, I want to ask you about your reading in terms of Native American literature. Did you come across authors that made you really think about that? Is it just me, or is this really big compared to us? Really big. <laughs> I feel like a little kid in like this I'm chair. Like peeking over <laughs> at these people, and uh, it's like bigger than the it's chairs, even though the yeah. chairs are really big. <laughs> 
it's making me feel like a kid. <laughs> Thank you for saying that, yeah. I'm not <laughs> criticizing the organization. I'm just very aware of this between us. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, you have to ask the question again. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just really glad you said that because I feel like I shrank like Alice in Wonderland. Um, so yeah, so Native American writers, Native so, American literature. So I, I didn't know about uh, Native books growing up. I think the only book I was ever handed um, in elementary school was a book called um, The Education of Little Tree. Does anybody love that book? I got bad news for you. Uh, we've, uh, we've known for a while um, that it was written by a former KKK member who was pretending to be Cherokee. Um, but it's not really ever fully come out because people prefer the made-up story that's really nice about this Cherokee kid in coming of age story, even though the guy made up everything. Uh, he was a speechwriter for George Wallace, who wrote the line, uh, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. He actually wrote that line, that whole line. Um, so he disappeared for a while and came back, and he was all of a sudden um, Forrest Carter, and went on, this book went on for years as a Native American fiction book. And uh, Oprah had it in her book club um, and eventually dropped it when somebody brought it to her attention. Um, so that was the only book that I was exposed to as a young person. Um, and I didn't know that then, but I also just didn't care about reading that much. Um, and I, you know, I'm Cheyenne, that was Cherokee. Um, it didn't necessarily speak to me even if I believed it was Cherokee at the time. Um, and then even when I became a reader, nobody was telling me what to read. Um, I was just reading whatever I picked up in the store that caught my attention and really was self-guided um, in figuring out what I liked to read and, and eventually in figuring out what I... Figuring out my voice came from reading whatever I wanted and not guided by institutions and, you know, teachers saying, you have to read these people to know what writing really is. There was a sense of freedom, like, I'm going to read whatever I want because I came to this completely on my own. So I didn't really start reading um, Native writers in earnest until 2014 when I got into the MFA program. I went to the Institute of American Indian Arts, and uh, they require that like um, there's a certain amount of books that you're reading and writing craft papers on that are written by Native authors. Um, so I had read some and, and felt a little bit like um, there was, there's a lot of reservation-based literature, and I felt like I, I didn't belong to that. And the feeling like you don't belong to, some, to something that you, that you belong to is not a good feeling. Um, and at, at, a, at that time, I was sort of figuring out who I was as a writer and who I was as a Native person. I started working in the Native community in Oakland at the same time that I got the job at the used bookstore. Um, so I, I, I was definitely shaped in a way through the MFA and through reading those writers, but it's not really what shaped me as a, a writer. It was really reading works in translation, a lot of works um, from around the world. Um, things that were not American interested me more than American books did. Oh, that's, that's very interesting. So um, it makes me, well, I want to talk about your characters. So the novel opens with a cast of characters. And you give us a little profile of each one. And I'm thinking, listening to you now, that the inspiration behind these was not literary, but very much um, experience. And I wonder if you could talk about creating this cast of characters and what they, what they mean to you. So. Um, the first, my first job at the, the Native American Health Center, I um, actually got it through um, roller hockey. Um, so I, not to talk about roller hockey too much, <laughs> but these two um, Indian brothers from Philadelphia, these are um, Indian people from India, um, but they were born in Philadelphia. They started this rink in Oakland, and 
they knew I needed a job in addition to this used bookstore job that paid like $7 and 35 cents an hour. Um, they were like, our cousin, um, is working at the native American health center. And so I just worked part time there and part time at the, the bookstore. And, um, so I really developed, um, as a writer at the same time, uh, this sort of discovering this, the native community that I, you know, I, I lived in Oakland and my dad's native, my mom's white. And we would go back to Oklahoma for, to see family. And that was what I knew of Cheyenne people and, and native community. I didn't, uh, I didn't know of the native community in Oakland. And, um, I'm, I'm getting to your question. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> after doing data entry for many years, I ended up doing uh, media work and I designed a thousand flyers and I never want to do it again. And we eventually started up um, a digital storytelling lab. And so I did a, a lot of storytelling work with community members and um, came to, to really respect people's life details. Um, so the reason I'm explaining all of this is because um, I didn't base the characters in there, there on, on community members. I didn't take people's details because the details in people's lives are earned and, and often, often hard earned. Um, and I, I really came to respect that. So I did have a, have a lot of, um, influence from my experience, uh, in the community, but, um, it was not directly from any single person beside myself, and I and I drew heavily from myself, and and my experiences. And uh, one of the characters, for instance, um, Opal Viola Victoria Bearshield, um, is on Alcatraz as a child, and um, I worked um, under a Native Youth Suicide Prevention Grant, and we took youth to Alcatraz and had elders tell stories of their time there, and I was I hadn't yet. I had started the novel and I um, hadn't yet, you know, fleshed it out at all. And I was wondering while I was there um, what it would have been like for a young person. Here we're, we're listening to these triumphant elders tell these stories of taking over a prison island in the middle of the San Francisco Bay for almost two years. It's like incredible stories. Um, but I also knew those stories are documented and those stories are something that people know. Uh, and so I wondered what would it have been like for a young person to sleep in the prison cells with their parent, like somebody who doesn't really understand the cause. They're just like dragged to a prison island. Um, and so that was like the birth of, of one of the voices in there. Therefore, was from just listening and looking at young people listening to these stories and wondering at um, what it would have been like for somebody like that. Yes, that's such a powerful part of the novel. Um, it also makes me think of your character, Dean, who gets a grant to do sort of oral history work. And I was thinking, you know, there's two characters that seem to sort of stand in for the author in some way. So Dean's one, and Edwin's the other. I wonder if you could talk about those two. They, they're a little different than the other characters. Well, Dean, um, he goes in front of a, um, a panel of judges, uh, it's for a cultural arts grant for the city of Oakland, um, and I did that. Um, so that was like directly from my life. Um, the sort of like um, maybe frowned upon aspect of that is that I actually got a grant from the city of Oakland to do a storytelling project and um, didn't do the storytelling project and just made it into fiction. Um, is that embezzlement? I, I hope not. Um, I was re recently, I moved back to Oakland after being away for a little while, and um, they gave me the, the key to the city, which was really incredible. And I sort of confessed my sins um, <laughs> in public, and I felt like I'm absolved now. Um, but I did go, you know, I, I went in front, and I got this grant, and I, and I, I was doing that type of work. I just didn't end up doing the, the project uh, outside of the fiction of it. Um, Edwin Black, I actually wrote bef way before thinking about writing a novel. Um, 
and I, I only realized this recently. I was writing a character who was obsessed with the internet um, and on it too much and thinking about the extinction of the black rhino. Um, and there are pieces of, of the voice of Edwin Black that came from the beginning of me trying to write through a lens that included being native as a character it happened well before, years before I started writing there, there. Um, part of finding my voice, um, it's, it started not knowing what, you know, how to write fiction. I think I wrote a lot of unreadable, bad stuff. Um, and I wasn't including myself. And as soon as I started including a perspective that was, you know, Edwin Black is, is, has a, a white mom and a native dad. Um, he doesn't know his dad and meets him on Facebook. Um, I very much grew up with a dad uh, who's full native and, and he's a fluent Cheyenne speaker. Um, so not, you know, none of the characters are exactly like me, but Edwin was the beginning of me starting to write through that experience. And I found um, that I, I felt most connected to the fiction I was writing when I started to include the lens that I saw life through. And I think before that, I, what I thought interesting or good fiction was, was, you know, being, proving that I was smart on the page by like using big words or sounding complicated. And that's a lot of the times what people say is the best or smartest stuff is like the hardest thing to understand. And it took me a long time to, to realize that like, oh, I'd rather be understandable. Um, I'd rather write toward readability um, and that was something that I really understood for the first time once I started my MFA and like became the mission statement for the book was to be clear and, and be understandable. Yes, indeed. And Edwin also, I mean, he's, he's a good conduit for some of your thinking. He's, he thinks a lot about indigenous art and how it has to have be rooted in tradition, but how does it speak to people now? And I wonder, um, you know, you address a very painful history in this novel and stereotypes, and you talk about urban Indians, and I wonder if that bridging the past and the present was part of the challenge for you with, um, as you told the, these characters' stories. Yeah, trying to like authentically talk about dispossession of identity and self and um, you know tribal identity and and land is difficult. Um, but trying to write through the insecurity of it, you know, I was born in Oakland and and my tribe lives in Oklahoma. And when we would go back to Oklahoma, um, we would see our cousins and they would sort of like look down on us for being less than. Um, not real like they were um, and it, I think it's it's such a complicated subject um, but it's but it's really rich because of its complications and and fiction is a really good way to to, to be able to talk about these things that if you don't talk about them if you just sort of see them in your periphery native people are often authenticated from the outside or were not talked about or were completely invisible um, and I think the reason I felt my voice come alive when I was able to approach some of these subjects um, was because uh, through these characters I was able to to approach these subjects um, and to to write through the insecurities of, of some of these experiences that um, you know, I didn't learn my traditions through YouTube, but I but I met kids who, you know, we'd be in circles introducing ourselves, and, and often that comes with what tri what tribes you belong to, um, and you'd hear a kid name off five tribes, and you'd know from his family, he didn't necessarily uh, wasn't raised by one of them predominantly, and so that identity is an urban native identity that is specific to urban native identity. The, the history of urban native people is, is people being re relocated from reservations all around the country and starting up families with people often from different tribes or, or not even native. And um, this is really complicated stuff. And um, 
And I think novels are a really good way to talk about complexity and to have, and not to point to an answer and say, this is, this is what we are, but it opens up the reader to ask questions and to feel through the characters, what might this be like? That's what I think novels are really good at asking the reader to, to, invite them to to feel what this might feel like um, through going through the experiences that they're going through. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Oh, um. <laughs> yes, and beyond. Um, so you bring us into all these different lives, and there's a, like a, everyone's coming together slowly in this novel. We have the big Oakland powwow, which we hear about, and everyone's sort of on a different path. Some people are planning to be there. Other people are going to be there um, circumstantially. You also mention um, spiders and spider legs appear in the story. And I started thinking, well, this is a big web, this novel, um, with different people weaving different parts of it. And I'm curious about you know, sort of a catalyst for it. Um, there's kind of a noir element um, in there, there, kind of a caper story with the drug dealer and the owed money. And I wonder if you could sort of talk about that as, you know, sort of a central, a centrifugal force that kind of brings people together and how that idea came to you. Yeah, I think, um, I think I, I wanted to write a novel where something happens. I think I was reading a lot of books where the whole point is that nothing ever happens. And I'm like, that's not what my life has been like. Um, and I'm seeing that like a lot of New York upper middle class people are writing them. And I'm like, your biggest problem is that you don't have a problem and that nothing happens to you. That's not a story. Um, so I, I was like kind of frustrated with that, like sort of the college novel or like, there's these different themes that I, um, I felt like my life was eventful and I wanted to, I wanted the book to be a vehicle um, that moved the reader through things happening. Um, and, uh, and the premise for the, for the book came to me in a, in a single moment and it was like, oh, they're all, all their lives are going to sort of like um, collide at the powwow and you're going to find out about them along the way. Um, but there's going to be this sort of like cataclysmic moment at the end. Um, but while I was writing it, um, speaking of things happening, um, I was at a West Oakland target, um, like the character Orville Redfeather. And um, I pulled uh, two spider legs out of my own leg. This is really gross, um, but it really happened. And um, I came out of the bathroom terrified, and I showed my wife, and um, they were like an inch and a half long, and there was, you know, there's like a bend. It was no mistaking what it was. Um, you know, I went through the experience of like pulling, the, sliding the things out of my leg. It was horrific. Um, and so we, we get home, and... Um, sort of like start searching the internet for what's wrong with me. And there's nothing and like spend, you know, that whole night and the next day sort of scouring the internet just as the character does. Um, and then I'm like, I should call my dad. Uh, Cause it's like, this seems like an Indian thing maybe. <laughs> and, and so I ask him like, do you, have you heard of anything like this? And he said, it sounds to me like you got witched. And I'm like, okay, well, what do I do? And he just said, I'll pray for you. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. And so um, I had this like thing that happened to me, and I'd already written some spider themes in, some language around spiders. Um, and I was like, well, I don't want this for my real life. Let me give it to my fictional characters and like have it work toward like, you know, an ominous sort of thing on the way to the powwow. And so that's that's where the spider legs thing came in. Well, I did not expect to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so another um, theme that gets talked about among the characters, uh, Opal's mother, for instance, talks about stories. And she says, you know, that we, you have to tell stories. You, 
you have to honor the past, you have to tell stories to understand the present. And there's so much storytelling in there, there, including healing stories, like at AA meetings, um, so that stories give people um, clarity and strength. And there's a lot in the novel about addiction, and I wonder if you could talk about that theme a little bit. Well, I, you know, I, I did storytelling work in the community, um, and I did it uh, through a nonprofit out of Berkeley. And the work was really like reconnecting people to themselves as natural storytellers. Um, and I think some of those themes and some of that came from, from my experience uh, in my job before I started. Um, well, no, I was doing it while I was writing the book. So obviously there was a big impact. Um, so we would, we would do these three-day workshops and we would teach people, uh, we would do story circles, three-day, full-day workshops. People would tell a story that, um, you know, that was meaningful or power, powerful to them. And um, then we would get them to write it down as a 300-word script. And then we would teach them um, digital uh, film software to help them make like a two- to three-minute film um, that was based on this story. And... What happened almost every time you told somebody to start writing the story that they just told is that they would abandon all the beautiful and original language they used when they were asked to just personally tell their story. And they would like hover way above it and generalize and like go into like essay mode or like because of the way, the way we teach writing in this country um, is is formulaic and it kills writing it kills the spirit of writing and it teaches you that this is what writing is supposed to be and so when people go to tell their stories they don't think they know how to do it when it comes to writing even though if you tell somebody to tell their story and you create an intimate setting and they are just using the instrument that is their body and voice they do it beautifully and originally um, so it was like reconnecting people to their 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 ability to tell stories um, so I was doing a lot of that work and, and getting to experience people's reconnection to their stories in, in a lot of different communities, not just Native communities, but a lot of um, communities that don't normally get their voices heard or get to tell their stories, a lot of you know, grant-based stuff around the country. Um, so that was largely where the storytelling influence comes from. Um, sometimes the, the storytelling and the oral, the power of oral storytelling trope um, kind of rubs me the wrong way because um, for Native people, it's like there's this idea that we only know how to do this sort of fireside chat, which is what they call this sometimes. Um, but this idea that we only know how to do things orally um, because we're primitive people, but like we've been writing for a really long time. Um, uh, M. Scott Mamaday won the Pulitzer Prize in 1958. Um, I think it was 58. Was it 68? I, did you just correct me? <laughs> <laughs> but this is, this is like almost 60 years ago, and we have a tradition of writing, and un we understand how to write in English, and, and for a lot of us, there isn't going back to writing in our language, and, and it's not necessarily the, the way to connect to our own people or other Native people. Um, so sometimes the storytelling thing, uh, the way it came to me was very much through this like digital storytelling work um, that uh, that I did just through through my job, and and you know there's something very human about um, that we do that. That's the structure of our narrative when we're talking to our neighbor, or we're talking to our mom on the phone, or we're driving in the car and and relaying our memory. The structure is story and a lot of times story gets put into this like oh it's healing wholesome whatever or it's like um telling a good story and that's the only thing worth telling it's much more ubiquitous and and i think um i, I talked about it a lot because because it is and i think um it's one of those words that's sort of um it's so alive as a thing but so dead as a word because We've sort of mangled it in different ways. Yeah. 
Interesting. So I'm thinking about trying to picture what a TV version of There There is going to be. I know you were, <laughs> it's been um, optioned, yes. And do, do you know anything about what's going to happen with that? I mean, that's a whole other kind of storytelling that is so different from a book. Yeah, I don't know. Um, HBO picked it up like right after I sold the book and then they dropped it and um, Sterling Harjo is actually the one adapting it. He's the Reservation Dogs creator. Um, and this was before Reservation Dogs came out and they definitely wouldn't have dropped it if if it happened, you know, right after that. Um, but it was also, they dropped it during the pandemic and there was just a lot of weird stuff going on. Um, I like TV adaptation for novels because if you look at the hours of like an audiobook of a novel, it's like average is like eight hours. That's like eight episodes, hour long episodes. Like it makes more sense to capture the nuance and the amount of details um, that are included in a novel rather than trying to condense it into two hours as a movie. Um, so I think, I think it's a really good way to do it. I have chosen to sort of not be an active element. Um, I was like, do get a native cast and get a native writing room and I'll and a native director and I'll trust, I'll trust that it's going to be its own thing. I don't expect the TV show to be the novel. The novel's the novel and the TV show should be the TV show. And um, the less I have my hands on it, the more I, if it's bad, I can be like, I didn't. <laughs> well, I look forward to that. I want to talk about your forthcoming novel now, your second book, Wandering Stars. Uh, it's just coming out in the spring, so be prepared for that. Um, I was opened it up, and there's a family tree, sort of a family dialogue, and I see names from there, there in Wandering Stars, Opal and Jackie and some other characters. It's a very different book, and I wonder if you could talk about you know, how you got from there, there to Wandering Stars and, and why these characters have stayed with you, or you stayed with them. So I first started writing the sequel to There There in March of 2018, before There There came out. Um, and it, initially it was just a straightforward, like, this is what happens to the people who survived the shooting that happens at the end of um, There There. It's not a spoiler. I think it's, um, you know, things don't go well at the end. And it says that very early on that they're, you're sort of told that they're going to try to rob the thing and there's a gun, like a Chekhov's gun situation. It's a 3D printed gun. Um, but then in 2019, I was, um, I was in Sweden because uh, there, there's been translated into a bunch of different languages. Um, and they asked me if I wanted a, a private tour of a museum. And I was like, sure. Um, I, I don't actually like museums that much. But I didn't want to be rude. Um, and they were, it was like this weird meta tour because a lot of museums now know that their whole history is super problematic. And so they were like, we know we shouldn't have this stuff, but <laughs> we still have it. And up here you see these people's stuff. Like we're trying to display it in a way that acknowledges that we know that we shouldn't have it, but <laughs> you should still see it because we still have it. And then they're, they're like, and up here, is, here's your people's stuff. Um, and I was looking at, you know, this is Southern Cheyenne regalia. And I see um, a newspaper clipping that says um, Southern Cheyennes um, in Florida in 1875. And I know enough about my, my tribe's history to know that um, we were never in Florida, as, as no one necessarily should be if they don't they don't have to be. Um, it's too easy. It's too easy to make fun of Florida. Um, so I go down this rabbit hole because uh, these are Southern Cheyennes and, and not that much is known about Southern Cheyennes. Um, I, I'm enrolled in the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma, but it's been very clear at home that we are not Arapaho. Um, like my dad's, you know, always talking shit about Arapahoes. Um, and we, we are Southern Cheyenne, specifically. Um, but the origin of the boarding schools um, comes from 
Richard Henry Pratt was the jailer at um, uh, a prison castle in St. Augustine, Florida. Um, they took 71 prisoners from Oklahoma to this prison castle. It's actually a star-shaped prison castle. Very convenient shape for my, the title of my next book, which is Wandering Stars, which is a coincidence. Um, and um, he had had them for three years. He had been in charge of the Buffalo Soldiers um, and had sort of decided that people who weren't white had a chance um, through, like, doing military drills and Christianizing them and used the same techniques that he used with the Buffalo Soldiers on these prisoners of war and um, thought he was so successful, he was like, let's go do it to the kids. Um, so he made you know the boarding school system, starting with Carlisle, and for decades, boarding schools like it and, and the same idea, Christianize and militarize and kill the Indian to save the man was um, a really devastating piece of American history and, and the loss of a lot of people's languages and cultures. That, that really lasted a long time in this country. And I realized that my tribe was, you know, at the sort of the beginning of that. And it just became something that I became really obsessed with. And um, it turned into this, the, this first half of, of my next book. And so you sort of find out that the, the family that you follow after the end of their there, uh, the family line goes all the way back to the experience of, of one boy running away from the St. Creek Massacre and ending up at this prison castle, um, where when I first started doing the research, um, I'd created this character named, named Star, and I was reading um, the list of the prisoners, um, and one of the prisoners, after I'd already created this character named Star, one of the characters' names was Star, and the one below him his name was Bear Shield, and that just blew me away because I, I'd already created the Bear Shield family. Um, the Bear Shield name was already in there, there, and so it just felt like something bigger was happening, and I just kept following, following that. Uh, that's a that's a great explanation, and the it's a really big, rich novel. It goes from the past into the present, um, so a lot of lot of challenges in that. I'm looking at time, and I want to leave time for audience questions. I want to thank you so much, Tommy, for speaking yeah, with me. Yeah, thank you, Donna. Folks, if you have a question, please come up to the mic. We'll take a few questions from the audience. Come on up if you have a question. We can start with a question from one of our virtual viewers who asks, will you continue to write books in the world of There, There, and your next book? Um, not right now. I'm not going to. I I sold my third novel uh, like a month ago. Um, Congratulations! <laughs> and it's completely different. It's still going to be Oakland because um, I love Oakland. Um, and it's my home um, and native characters and um, and I'm I'm w working on finishing a screenplay, um, which the people who I sold it to um, may or may not like. Um, and I'm finding, I'll be finding that out soon. Um, but I, for now, I, I only meant it to be the two books. Okay, I think we got somebody coming with a question. Come on down. Hi, um, I was curious about the creation of the cover. Um, so I was curious what kind of process that followed and if there's, what meaning is in the cover? Since you brought all your stuff, I thought you were going to ask something really scary because you were going to be ready to like no, I just gotta catch make a, a run for it after <laughs> you asked the question. <laughs> so the cover, both this cover at, uh, for there, there, and the next one was really hard. Um, the first cover, just to try to tell it briefly, um, they put out was like a, a depiction of a native person and it had holes in it like bullet holes and I could tell the person who r drew the the native person in regalia was not native because they drew the face really dumb and I 
And I told the, my editor that I was like, "This is this is drawn by a white person who sees us a certain way," and they were like, "But we really love it." <laughs> and so I, I was like, "Okay." Um, uh, so I, I have this background in, in graphic design, and so I, uh, I had a train ride from from Oakland to Modesto, where I was being picked up at the time by my family, and I took it into Photoshop, and I just did the face to look just normal and something you just wouldn't notice. Um, and when we, when my wife and son picked me up, I showed him first, and I was like, "What do you think? What do you think of it now?" Because they both saw the same dumb face, um, and he was like, "Dada, that's you." <laughs> I'd like made it into myself, so I'd created myself dressed in regalia on the cover of my own book, <laughs> and I was like, "Well, they love it. I don't want to be, you know, troublesome." This is like my first book, and I'm just grateful that they are even publishing it. So I sent it away, and they're like, oh, we love it. And I'm like, oh, my God. My friends see this. They're gonna, everyone's going to see what my son just saw. And um, I'm not shortening the story. And um, eventually the sales reps were like, we don't like it. And they just shut it down. And that, I realized, like, oh, this whole co- book cover thing is like much more complicated than I ever thought. So they, the next one they sent, it was like a lunch bag brown color cover um and it was just a headdress sitting in the middle of it and i was like no <laughs> and so i felt like they plucked two feathers off the headdress and and made it orange cuz that's my last name and sent it to me and i was like fine <laughs> so that's that's the story of the this cover i won't tell the story of the next cover thank you Um, I wanted to first start off by saying thank you for talking about the no- novels that you read. I'm a big fan of novels, um, but I have also ran into the issue recently of reading things where it just feels like there's just a jargon of language that I don't understand, and I'm Googling everything, and I'm like, okay, where was I at with reading, and what is this paragraph trying to say? So I just really loved how you talked about writing. Um, so I wanted to ask another question following up with that um, about what influences you as a writer and what is your writing process? Um, yeah, I think, you know, for in, as far as native writers go, I think um, Louise Erdrich um, was a really big influence, and I think she really r- writes toward readability, too. Um, I think, um, as far as non-native writers go, I think aspiring to um, some, like, tiny, tiny piece of the brilliance of what Toni Morrison has done with language, mm-hmm. um, what she's done with language. I, I, feel, I feel a little bit like ripped off by the way people talk about, have talked about Toni Morrison as a writer. Mm-hmm. Like sh- she matters if you're black or she matters if you care about black people. And I, I was a little bit later to her and by the time I read all of her work, I was like, she is just the best fiction writer we've ever had. Like, right. hands down. I, I, I have no qualms about qualifying her as that. And, so, and I think she writes toward readability, too. I think, I think she does have high-concept stuff that you can write books about. And her nonfiction is insane to read, and it's very hard for me to read because um, she's just super brilliant that way. But her fiction, I think she r- really writes in this way that um, is toward readability and not toward ununderstandability. Um, in, a, in a way that I appreciate. Well, thank you for the book. It was great. I really liked it a lot. Thank you. I, as I was reading, I noticed one chapter would be uh, a first person, and the next one would be third person. Where you were talking about the person in the third person, and the next would be a first-person narrator, and it kind of alternated. So I was wondering about that. So um, when, I, when I set out to write a lot of characters, um, I knew this was a challenging thing, and one of the risks is that the reader gets confused and can't tell one from the other, and, and I'm a very insecure person, a, a very insecure writer, and I didn't ever want that to happen to the reader. And uh, I started, you know, started reading craft books before I got into my MFA and wanted to understand 
the inner workings of what you know made fiction um, how it how it worked and um, POV is if you're not a writer as a reader you will feel a POV shift but you won't consciously be like we're going from third to first now or like we just shifted into present it won't you won't immediately do that um, so in not believing entirely in my ability to do all the voices distinctly as we move from one character to another I tried and I don't do it every time but I tried as much as possible to switch POVs as a kind of crutch a cr craft crutch um, so that the reader would never feel like oh this is too much like the character I just read and then notice sort of a peek behind the curtain like oh there's the writer doing the writing like you never want that to happen um, as a writer you never want the reader to think about the author you want them to be so convinced the suspension of disbelief you know is fully in effect hello uh, i've got uh, two questions on my favorite character orville and um, both of the questions involve um, ambiguity. And I don't know if you planned it that way or just wanted to leave it that way. The first one is uh, what happens to Orville at the end? <laughs> because you left something that, I don't know if anybody else picked up on this or I'm the only one. His grandmother, Opal, had this uh, superstition, especially about numbers. And she was doing something about contemplating numbers. And something happened at the last scene where she thought the numbers were positive, and whether that means he'll be a continuing character or you'll use him again at some point or his story is finished. That's the two questions, or is that one? <laughs> it's a long one. That's the whole, that's the yes. whole thing. So if anybody cares about um, spoilers, um, plug your ears. <laughs> um, so I can talk about it. And I think it's it's not the worst kind of spoiler. Um, in Wandering Stars, Orville's like the main character. Mm. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and if I may, a second question? Because you sort of answered it, but you didn't answer it uh, to my satisfaction. It was that, that growth on his leg where you said he scratched and he pulled out spider web. Is that a true something condition or... Did you just use that as a metaphor for something? No, I pulled spider legs out of my leg Did in a target, a yeah. second target bathroom. <laughs> uh, they were on a piece of toilet paper. Okay. And um, that happened to me. <laughs> okay. And if I may, one last uh, ambiguous <laughs> question <laughs> about the title. Um, when you say "they're there," are you referring to "there's something there"? That version? Or they're there, you're patting somebody on the shoulder, reassuring them. Because it could be either one to me. I tried to have it be uh, multiple things. Okay. Um, it comes from a Gertrude Stein quote where in her book, um, in her novel, Everybody's Autobiography, a character asks a character, why don't you write about Oakland? And she says, there is no there there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have used that to slander Oakland and talk about how Oakland doesn't have a sense of place or Oakland doesn't have like a soul. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Everyone who knows Oakland knows that the opposite is true. Um, but, you know, even Berkeley people kind of play on it. Um, I hate Berkeley people. Because um, <laughs> as you go into Berkeley from a certain part of Oakland, they have a giant wooden sign that says here for Berkeley side and there for Oakland side. It's like this <laughs> stupid dig at Oakland. Um, and the here side has like people have knitted like the feet of the H. Like with, it's disgusting. Um, and so there was, there's the Gertrude Stein quote that I sort of knew from an Oakland lens. There was something in the quote when she says that there, the reason she doesn't write about it is because there is no there there. She wasn't saying there's no sense of Oakland. The place that she grew up was farmland. And when she came back after leaving as a teen, it was developed over. So like the memory of the place was developed over. And the st there, there's about people trying to relate to a city and to talk about Native people relating to a city where everything's not land exactly. It's developed over, but it's trying to figure out how Native people relate to city. Um, so 
trying to work that in. There's a, and then there's a sort of Radiohead reference that I won't go into. Um, but there's multiple things that I was trying to do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. First I don't time. really hate Berkeley people that much. I, <laughs> I'm, I do hate the the yarn and the the stuff that's hanging on the H. First off, thank you so much for your work. I really loved it. As someone who is obsessed with cities and especially the people in them, um, this book was amazing. Um, my question is: In the last couple of years, we've seen Native stories spring up in the media here and there. What is a story that you're excited to see or hope to see in the future? Um, I think you know contemporary Native stories, more city stories. Um, I, th you know, we are 574 federally recognized tribes, and that's like a lot of distinct languages, worldviews, um, creation stories, histories to the U.S. government, um, experiences of class in, in different ways that aren't, it aren't, it's not just, you know, poverty, it's not just addiction. There's like a whole slew of stories about people getting like big checks and going crazy. Um, there's a book by Oscar Hokea called uh, Calling for a Blanket Dance. One of the stories or uh, chapters in that novel he talks about people, what they do with getting these big checks. There's just like a, so there's 574 federally recognized tribes. There's about 400 not federally recognized tribes. There's almost a thousand nations. Um, so what I hope for is for the door not only to be open, but to like burst, like a dam to burst. And for this flattened stereotypical like single image of us as this feathered sad thing on a horse with our head slung over to be completely obliterated by and and to be to, to restore our humanity by giving us all the nuance that we've always deserved and having our stories told from all these different perspectives um just getting more native stories out there because we really haven't had very many and and we just got two tv shows for the first time in how many years of tv how many like there's been like a hundred thousand tv shows and we have two and they're both gone now and so um we just need more and, and we need nuance and complexity thank you thank you howdy tommy um it's been a pleasure reading your book for english class i've definitely read it three or four times so with that being said, I'm glad that the, the people who came up asked the questions because the question I'm going to ask is pertaining to the family tree. So in the world of Native Americans and different tribes that are both acknowledged and unacknowledged, how do you guys handle classism and colorism? And how does that um, depict and how people operate within the both of these kinds of worlds? Thank you. So he said uh, within um, the Native world just how – how does classism and colorism work? Um, and I think classism wise, um, I haven't seen too many trouble because we're, we have all been sitting around a, a pretty similar class place for a long time. Um, there are like casino people and um, it's a very small percentage. A lot of people think that we're all getting oil and, and casino money and we're all going to universities for free and getting free healthcare, and it's just not true at all. Um, so the class piece, I haven't, I haven't had too many problems with. We do have a race problem. We do have a anti-black problem in the native community, in a lot of native communities. And um, I hope to find a way to talk about it. I, I talk about it a little bit in my next book. I hope I get to talk about it a little bit more. Um, but it is a problem, and there, there is an opportunity, a huge opportunity missed in, in amongst black and native communities in ways that for, we have been connected through families and through history in ways that we are much more alike than we are different. And, you know, in places like Oklahoma, they have a checkerboard state and they separated black people, white people and native people purposefully. So there's been ways that systemically they have not wanted us to, you know, align our thinking. Um, just just as like white people became white people when they were like hey irish people don't you wouldn't you rather be like on top and not like considered <laughs> so like join the whites and like that was and italians like there was there's a moment in history where they have 
people have done things to make sure there's been uniting or not uniting purposefully. And I think there's a lot of space to, for stories and for, and for novels to do the work uh, of healing some of those things that have, that have separated us and, and continue to to this day. Thank you. Um, hi. Uh, I'm really nervous. I don't. <laughs> okay. Um, so I recently had to read your book for my class. I'm currently a senior. And your book was like the basis of a really big lesson for us. And I have two questions. Um, my first question would be about the character Tony. And I realized like he had a really bad upbringing, right? And I was wondering how you made such a character that like had so much turmoil set behind him have like such a beautiful ending. And then my second question would be, do you feel as though this book has given enough exposure to the Native community? So t Tony Loneman um, came came to me really early in writing there there, mm -hmm. and he came really fully formed. Mm -hmm. um, but I and even though like you l learn very early on that he's part of this nefarious plot to you know rob something that should never be robbed, um, I always thought of him as an, a kind of anti-hero. Like I always thought that he was gonna end up um, doing something that would overcome whatever conditions brought him to doing the thing that he ends up doing. And in the middle of writing the book, I wrote the ending of the book. And as soon as I wrote it, I knew it was the ending and it was for Tony. Um, so I don't know how to answer how I did it, but I, I always conceived him, of him a certain way. And, and early on, um, when I wrote the ending, and I knew it was for him. I knew that was how I knew I wrote the ending. Um, as far as like enough exposure, I, I don't think, I think my book has had an ex insane amount of exposure. Um, and I, I couldn't ask for more. For the native community as a whole, like we need, we need a lot of other books and a lot of other forms of representation from different tribes because we're, we're so diverse. Um, so I, I think I was trying to write an urban pr perspective and an Oakland story, and I feel like really happy with with the reception and the exposure that it's gotten. Um, and I couldn't I couldn't ask for more personally. If I was asking for more for the native, you know, whole, um, it was be it would be like you know what I said earlier. Like we we just need a lot more. Um, we need a lot more exposure. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, uh, sir. Um, thank you so much for uh, what you're doing and continue to do, hopefully. And um, my question uh, is coming from Minnesota. I hope you don't mind. Uh, that's where I'm from. I'm actually, I was born in Oakland, so there we go. Um, but uh, my buddy, we're actually newly friends, and uh, he was pretty excited. Uh, we're, we both got to read your book, just full disclosure. <laughs> but uh, anyway, here's what he asks. Uh, how, um, as a native myself, I would ask how uh, us as natives can reinvent ourselves in a way that allows our culture to modernize and stand out on its own. And shout out to Xander, uh, Minnesota. He's uh, actually his father, uh, Winnebago slash Ho Chunk. I don't know what that might mean to you, but just as context. And then I'll uh, thank you so much. Thank you. And go Dubs. <laughs> 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 um. We had a Winnebago family. Um, so the only other family that we grew up around um, in Oakland were the Browns. And, you know, being the oranges and only knowing one other family, I was like, okay, what's going on with the color thing? <laughs> and it was never explained. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think novels are a really... Novels and filmmaking are a really interesting way to be able to modernize and not be trapped in the where's the flute, where's the drum sort of trap of like stuck in how to make it sound authentic and native. 
um, be, like you know anybody who's seen Reservation Dogs, you can still be talking about Native life and be contemporary, and and make it feel like right now. And we need we need to be modern, because because of how much we've been historical, um, and novels through language and through just talking about um, modern ideas and and being in modern settings have the unique privilege of being able to depict us in that way that lifts us above. You know, I, I feel bad for musicians sometimes um, because it, it feels like a really big challenge like uh, to, to do the work of, of feeling like an authentic native musician that, that's steeped in tradition while also being acknowledged as modern is tricky work. And sometimes visually for visual artists, like what in your painting how is this native? Sometimes the signposts are really tricky to get around and, and to, to transcend. So I don't, I don't have any good answers. I'm lucky to be working in literature because we can do stuff with language. Um, and, and I think filmmakers have a, a similar thing going on. Thank you. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for tonight. Please join me in another round of applause for Donna Seaman and Tommy Orange. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for being here. I remind you, this program is available on CPL's YouTube and Facebook channels. Please tell a friend who couldn't make it. We will start the book signing in a few minutes. If you want to have your book signed, please remain seated. Please remain seated. We will call you up in groups. We have many, many people to get through tonight. So we're asking you to please be very quickly as we come up to do the book signing, be very fast in the line. So thank you for your understanding. We want to make sure we get through everyone.